and it is my pleasure to serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I think we've heard enough about the storm. So let's talk about something else <laughs> about that. Right? We leave that stuff outside. <laughs> Starting with my dad. <laughs> Popular topic uh, for me. He had a lot of jobs. One of them was a contractor. He could build a house from the ground up. The foundation, the shingles, do everything. And so, as a kid, I got taken on lots of jobs with him. But when you're little, you're not old enough to do, like, masonry and stuff like that. Right? The cinder blocks weighed more than I did. A Ten-year-old with a pack of shingles up a ladder, not a great idea. So I started as the gopher. Right? So you go for things. And this is really kind of good for young people to learn the trade because you learn what all the tools are named. Right? So it's good. You go for the tools. One day... They asked me to get the duckway. <laughs> Somebody worked in construction. So the duckway, I'm like, what? OK. So I didn't know what it was, but I went anyway to look for it, right? So you have some pride. You don't want to admit it. I'm looking through all the tools. The first thing I'm figuring is, OK, I'm going to find something that's labeled Craftsman Duckway, right? And that's what I'm looking for. Nope, apparently they don't make that. So process of deduction, right? all the tools I know. Well, good, bad thing happens, right? So I know all the names of the tools. OK, I got to go back. So I go back, and I ask, what's a duckway? Answer, I don't know, two or three pounds. <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about like misdirection, right? Being misguided, being sent on a mission that you shouldn't be going on, right? So we find ourselves in the rest of the story. You can always catch up. It's going to be on the recaps. I'm going to have to like kind of leave a lot of stuff out. Otherwise, we're just going to be here for three hours, right? So... Real quick, you can go back online, you can watch the rest of the story, you can kind of catch up. Some of you are actually doing that. Uh, I'll see you in like three years. It's going to take you to <laughs> catch up on those things. It's pretty long, but we want to honor God's word here. It's all important. If we're saying this is all God's word, it's all important. So we're looking at all of it right now. We are in the time where the Judeans, right, so the southern kingdom falls last. Zedekiah, right, so he gets his eyes ripped out. He sees his family die. That's the last thing he sees. It's absolutely horrible. And then he gets taken away to Babylon. And that's where we're at right now. So they're in exile. But we saw that there's still, like, Jeremiah is still living in Judah. So that's what's going on here. So now... Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, he's going to be sent there to kind of manage things. So no more of these client kings. He's going to install a governor, and this is where we're at in the story. So Jeremiah 39.8. Meanwhile, the Babylonians had burned Jerusalem, including the royal palace and the houses of the people, and they tore down the walls of the city. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took as exiles to Babylon the rest of the people who remained in the city, those who had defected to him and everyone else who remained. But Nebuzaradan allowed some of the poorest people to stay behind in the land of Judah, and he assigned them to care for their vineyards in the fields. King Nebuchadnezzar had told Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, to find Jeremiah. And there's another line there. <clears throat> See that he isn't hurt. Look after him. So that's, that's what he's charged with doing. So he's in prison. So Nebuchadnezzar sends messages, get Jeremiah out of prison. Gets him out of prison, and he put him under the care of this guy, Gedaliah. And we're going to learn about Gedaliah today. Uh, so Jeremiah stayed there in Judah, not in prison any longer. That's the backdrop. Interestingly, there's a little note in there. While he's still in prison, remember ebad Melech? The Ethiopian or the Cushite, he was the guy that got Jeremiah out of the cistern, right? And so the Lord gave a message for this guy, like, all's going to go well for you. So, yes, it's all going to get destroyed, everything around you, but essentially because you did that for Jeremiah, you're good. And so there's a note about that. If we turn the page, Jeremiah 41. The Lord gave a message to Jeremiah after Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the other captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being sent to exile in Babylon. The captain of the guard called for Jeremiah and said, The Lord your God has brought this disaster on the land, just as he said he would. For these people have sinned against the Lord and disobeyed him. That is why it happened. 
but I am going to take off your chains and let you go. If you want to come with me to Babylon, you are welcome. I will see that you're well cared for. But if you don't want to come, you may stay here. The whole land is before you. Go wherever you like. If you decide to stay, then return to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, the grandson of Shaphan. He has been appointed governor of Judah by the king of Babylon. Stay there with the people he rules. But it's up to you. Go wherever you like. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, gave Jeremiah some food and money and let him go. So Jeremiah returned to get Eliah, son of Hikem at Mitzpah, and he lived in Judah with the few who were still left in the land. So you're going to see this, just a quick note. <clears throat> you're going to see, actually, as we get into Daniel and stuff, these Babylonians, actually, through the course of this, seem to be getting nicer and nicer and nicer. And this is leading up to, actually, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar actually worships God at a certain point. So interesting to note, right? So they're, they're just being kind of submissive here. Jeremiah is doing as he told, and they're going to be winning people over. They're going to see that, that course of action. Here's where it gets really confusing, so I made another chart. <laughs> Not as confusing as last week, but here we have books of the Bible running in parallel. So if this interests you and you want to try to put the Bible back together the way it really goes chronologically-ish, it's not perfect because we don't exactly know in certain places, these will be helpful to you. So it's in our app. We'll talk about the app later. So largely in this section where Jeremiah 52, 2 Kings 25, and 2 Chronicles 36 come together, they're going to be longer and shorter versions the destruction of the temple. So it just goes into all this stuff. So certain books will explain it at length or different things at length. Others will just summarize. And that's what we see in 2 Kings 25-23. When all the army commanders and their men learned that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah as governor, they went to see him at Mitzvah. These included Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan, the son of Korea, Zariah, son of Tunameth, the Notophathite, Jezaniah, son of the Makathite, and all their men. Glad you didn't have to do that, right? Gedaliah <laughs> vowed to them that the Babylonian officials meant them no harm. Don't be afraid of them. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and all will go well for you, he promised. But in mid-autumn of that year, Ishmael, son of Nathaniah, and grandson of Elishama, who was a member of the royal family, went to Mitzvah with ten men and killed Gedaliah. He also killed all the Judeans and Babylonians who were with him at Mitzvah. Then all the people of Judah, from the least to the greatest, as well as the army commanders, fled in panic to Egypt, for they were afraid of what the Babylonians would do to them. So if you're going to hop around a little bit, you've got to go to Jeremiah 40, and you kind of get the longer version of this, where there's an exchange here. So Ishmael's the bad guy. He's been sent by the king of Ammon to kill Gedaliah, the governor. All right, so we have this exchange with Johanan, who becomes kind of an important figure in here. And there's like two rounds of him warning him what's going to happen. And in this, he even says, like, I'll go kill Ishmael for you. Gedaliah doesn't believe him. He says, you will do no such thing. So here you have like Gedaliah and Jeremiah. They're kind of the good guys there. And what they're saying is, eh, don't cause any trouble. Why? The Lord said, look, you're to be submissive to the Babylonians now. Do that. And so they're obeying. And so you get these other guys who are not. So at first, at first, it looks like Johanan is a good guy here in this story. If we turn the page, Jeremiah 41. Again, all this is happening during that little section there in 2 Kings 25. Sure enough, it happens. He takes 10 men with him. They're eating a meal, and they kill him. They kill the governor. And he also kills all the Judeans and Babylonian soldiers who are with them. So this is bad. They're committing a really bad crime. Everyone's going to be mad at them. <clears throat> Ishmael's a really, like, not an honest dude because there are 80 people coming from different places to worship. Yes, the temple's destroyed, but you can still offer, like, grain offerings and other things there. They want to worship. Ishmael comes out before they get there, and he's crying. And he's saying, look what happened to Gedaliah. Come see. When they get into the town, they kill them. They kill 70 of them. There's 80 men. They kill all but 10. It says, real bad. They dump their bodies into a cistern, and they take a bunch of captives. But when Johanan and the other military leaders hear about this crime, they go out to get them. They catch up with them at the large pool near Gibeon. And now the people are captured, taken hostage. They're cheering, and they're starting to help him do this. But Ishmael gets away with eight of his men, so he escapes this whole thing. Well, now they're all going to plan to leave for Egypt. Why? Well, again, they killed the Babylonian soldiers. They're going to be in trouble. So they're going to seek refuge in Egypt. And if we turn the page 
This is what happens. Essentially, these people go to Jeremiah and they say, pray to God for us. Ask him what we should do. We're going to do whatever he says, essentially. All right, so we'll do whatever he says. All right, Jeremiah replied, I'll pray to God and I'll hide nothing from you. Interesting response, Jeremiah 42, 5. <laughs> then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord your God be a faithful witness against us if we refuse to obey whatever he tells us to do, whether we like it or not. We will obey the Lord our God to whom we are sending you with our plea. For if we obey, everything will turn out well for us. Okay. So, 10 days. And Jeremiah hears from the Lord, and he goes back. And essentially what's at play here, just to overview this, is that, again... They're getting punished, so they're like being put in timeout in this exile. It's like a 70-year timeout, long timeout. But just to give you like the idea here, I am punishing you, says the Lord. Why? Well, they're worshiping other gods. And you may think, if you're new to this whole thing, well, what's the big deal? I just went to like a different a synagogue or a different church. What's the big deal? That's not how they worship. They worship other gods by killing their children. Bring your kid. No, we, we're not going to do the kids' church today. We're going to sacrifice my child here. You know, this is insanity. It's really, really, really bad. So they're being sent off to punishment. So that's what Jeremiah goes through, right? You see, so you've got to stay here and take it. Don't go to Egypt. Don't do that. You're not going to be safe there. And so really, between here and chapter 44, it's just round after round of that with just different, different things being talked about. Essentially, don't go to Egypt. But then Jeremiah adds, like, why did you even bother asking me, basically? You're not going to do anything I say anyway. So he knows their character. And sure enough, that's what they say. If we're in Jeremiah 43, you lie. And then they throw Barak or Baruch, his secretary, under the bus. Right? He just wants us all to die here. We're going to go to Egypt. Okay. And so that's what they do. They take everybody to Egypt. So Jeremiah's with them too. And they end up at this place called Tampanese. In Egypt, -ish. it's like really northern Egypt if you're looking at a map. <clears throat> a couple of rounds of this happens again, but with different kind of illustrations that Jeremiah is using. There are stones, and he, he, the Lord tells him to put some stones under, good translation, like the pavement of the entrance of the palace for Pharaoh. And that is where uh, Nebuchadnezzar's throne will be placed. So what is he telling him? Nebuchadnezzar is going to get you here too, right? You're supposed to stay be subservient to that. And what's interesting is he's letting them stay in Judah too. He's not even saying you got to go to exile. He's making it even easier. You can stay in Judah, just be subject to Nebuchadnezzar and take your time out. Nope. So he gives this kind of judgment against them, this prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar is going to find you there. There's kind of a weird thing, and don't get stuck there. We'll stay on application. There's this queen of heaven that they keep talking about that these people are worshiping. People get all stuck there and speculate. It's just another one of these foreign gods that they're worshiping. But these people are nuts. They're making the claim like, you know, when we were worshiping the queen of heaven, everything was great for us. But that's exactly what got them in the problem in the first place. So you're looking at these, these kind of people that you're dealing with here. Not normal. Like they're just totally out of control. So again, that theme, you're not going to be safe in Egypt. But here you have this guy, Johanan. You thought he was going to be good, right? Nope. He's not listening either. He misguides everyone and takes them there. Even though Jeremiah, they acknowledge him as a prophet, right? They asked him, what do we do? And so they know he's a prophet. They, listen, they just don't listen to it. And if we're being honest, we see this as well today. We see this a lot today. We have a clear message from the Lord, right? We know it's the right thing. Maybe we've even checked it out, right? But the people don't want the right answer, right? They want the wrong answer. They'll seek another one. I feel you, Jeremiah, right? You didn't want the right answer in the first place. So they don't get it, and they just keep going down the line until they get it from another person. And there's always a false teacher or a false leader who is totally willing to give them that wrong answer. Always to appeal to the immediate. Tell them exactly what they want to hear. We saw it last week in Hananiah, right? The uh, yoke. Right? Now he's got a yoke of iron, the false prophet. You just keep seeing this over and over and over again. Ishmael, misdirected zeal. You know, you just over Johanan. Seems to be getting it. But every time, it seems like the people just reject those who are being faithful. They don't want to listen. That's difficult. 
Don't, don't tell me that. From Jeremiah to Gedaliah all the way to today. People, as we saw last week, will be more than happy to listen to false teachings. And one of the most common techniques is to appeal to our zeal for control. What's faith? It's in God's hands. We have a zeal for control. And it all boils down to it, playing God. But the Word of God says this, Proverbs 19, 21. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. 14, 12. There's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. And it's redundant. 16, 25, too. You may think it's right, but is it God's plan? When it's repetitive, too, it's probably important. The irony is that under the illusion of control, those people are being controlled. That's the horrible irony. So we saw people like the false prosperity prophet Hananiah. They aren't in line with God's will and God's word, and that's the problem. A lot of people today, they think they may be doing something that is right or following someone who's right, but... Is it God's will? So we see example after example of this. And the question's been raised recently. So we're going to do something that I don't know if we've ever done in this church. And you just don't see it a lot in church. And you'll find out why in a minute. <laughs> so know that I love you <laughs> as I say these things. So the question is, who do we listen to? Right? So there, bless you. There are a lot of teachers out there today. A lot of options, right? But who's right? And I've been asked this. Who do we listen to? And so I'm going to give you that answer from here today. All right? We're going to get that answer today. So we look at the biblical steps. So first of all, we have to be in the Word. Don't be like Jehoiakim, right? Tearing up the scroll that Jeremiah sent to him and burning it. You know, like, it's here. It's all right here. And I'm going to give you some other tools, too, to get into this a little bit more. The answers are here. It has to line up with this. But here's the thing. In context, in context, you have to know a good teacher is always going to teach you context. Do you see what I did today? And I was saying, like, I'm a great teacher. But you get my point, right? I'm telling you what is happening in the backdrop. In context. We saw the problem with using, like, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. <sighs> You know, if you read just the line before and after that, you will never use that line for short-term, shallow prosperity ever again. It's ignorant, and it's insulting. If you have a love for God's word and God's people, know what's surrounding that verse. Horrible. When you use a shallow verse for short-term prosperity, when these people are in the midst of a horrible circumstance, and that verse is not about what's happening now, that verse is what's happening 70 years from now. So not you. Not you. <laughs> it's about like your grandkids are going to see prosperity. But right now, you're going to be eating your children and starving to death. All right? So here's what happens. Scripture validates Scripture. So the person should be using a lot of Scripture. And that Scripture, so like we just saw, should validate Scripture. One-liners and you can't find it anywhere else, that's a problem. So you want to use, you want to hear more from who? Me or God? I've had people come, thank you, right answer. God, not me. I've had people come up to me and say, there's too much scripture. Like, do you know what you're really saying when you say that? Like, I don't like to hear from God. And maybe that's the problem. Right? And so <clears throat> that's a warning sign. When you see like just a little scripture and then the person goes on like a half hour, 40 minute rant, no, right? So the less scripture someone uses, the greater the chances they're going to get it wrong. That, that's just the first thing. Or insert too much opinion or take it out of context. So knowing the word, we have to test everything against the word. Now, let's look at the spiritual test. So this is interesting. First John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Same today. We were warned about that. 1 Thessalonians 5.20. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. 
So I showed you. You can test it against the word, right, if you know it well. But there's a more practical application here. How do we test it? Well, a good indicator of someone's spiritual well-being is the spiritual fruit they're producing. Right? So Jesus tells us this. Like, essentially, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck way. Right? So <laughs> it's a duck. So I want to show you something. Teachers, teachers should be judged. A lot of pastors don't say that. <laughs> but James 3.1, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Why? For we who teach will be judged more strictly. You're handling God's word. And so people, oh, what's the big deal? People are coming to Christ. Who cares about the false teachers and this and that? Well, the Bible cares a lot about it. I mean, whole books of the Bible are written about it. It talks about it a lot. It's really important because they can misdirect you. Right? That's why they talk about it so much. So teachers should be judged more strictly. That's important. So I'm going to show you how. So first thing, Jesus, we judge a tree by its fruit. He says that. So here's the thing, larger sections of Scripture, just put this in your mind, Matthew 5 through 7. Right? It's just one continuous, continuous flow, the Sermon on the Mount. One thing, Jesus doesn't stop talking in there and says, oh, you know what, come back next week. No. And he makes certain points in the beginning that he then clarifies. I've showed you this in the past. The problem when you stop reading, oh, we're just going to do chapter 5 and then forget about it. No, you keep going. So what people do, they get to Matthew 7, right, the first verse there, and it's kind of like showing up to church about like 30 minutes into my sermon, sitting down, right, because you're in line for coffee. <laughs> you're sitting down and, and hearing, don't judge. And you're like, that sounds great. I got to go to the bathroom. I had too much coffee. And then you leave, and the sermon's over, right? So, but this, he, Jesus continues, right, it's a good thing. Matthew 7.15, beware of false prophets who come in disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify or judge them by their fruit. That is, by the way, they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. I had dyslexia there for a moment, sorry. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not Produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. What do you think he's insinuating there? Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. You can identify people by their actions. Okay, Galatians, the book of the Bible. Really what Galatians is all about? False teachers. What are they spreading? You have to be under the law of Moses. You have to be Jewish in order to become a Christian. This is heresy, and Paul is straightening that out. And so the whole letter is really about that. Within this context of these false teachers, he says this, Galatians 5.19. The idea here is that you are under the spirit, not the law of Moses. So when he says law, that's why he's doing that. He's Mutually exclusive. Galatians 5.19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And just keep that up. So I've done something interesting well, let's see, yeah, let's move to the chart. I've done something interesting because, and this is the suggestion of my wife, who's on the slides today. So just marital advice, not advisable. Like, okay, so that's not good. <laughs> She's on the slides, working the slides today. Anything could happen. But she suggested, she was a school teacher for many years. You know, why don't you, in the sentence, it gets jumbled up. People get confused. Why don't you just make more charts? Like, let them see it. So if you don't like this, you can blame it on her. Um, <laughs> again, not great for my... So, so this is how, you, so you can see it. We'll do something a little bit different here. And I want to go through some of these things. So essentially, right, if someone is doing the bad things, they are not to be listened to. That's the thing. Good things listened to. So what are they? Let's just go through them. Sexual immorality, pretty obvious, of any kind. 
impurity goes along with this. Big word here, licentiousness, right? So disregard for strict rules or correctness, right? So you're a very disobedient person. Idolatry, sorcery, so worshiping other gods. Enmity, being actively opposed or hostile to something or someone. So I'm going to admit something. I thought it was enmity. Enmity. I've been saying it wrong for years, and no one, I have no friends. No one corrected me at all. <laughs> enmity, right? like because I use that word a lot. Right. <laughs> Strife, an angry or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues. Conflict, someone who likes conflict, right? Not good. Jealousy, outbursts of anger. Now, I've talked about this before, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to show you really quick James 1.20. For human anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Doing that really fast. You're not God. So we have to line that up with the fruits of the Spirit, right? So let Jesus clear the temple. Let him do that stuff. Not for us. So be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, Ephesians 4. Chart again, more examples. Selfish ambition. Dissension, that's more disagreement. That leads to discord. Factions, envy, drunkenness, and carousing go together. So basically, you like these wild parties where you're being really loud and boisterous with your friends. That is not from the Spirit. Not good. So all of the above are marks of someone who is not walking like a Christian. The Word of God. Not Pastor Gene is saying this, right? So also, one thing I did is... Uh, we, I went back to the Greek. So when I prepare for these messages, so NLT, just good translation, give you the idea, and sometimes I put the brackets in where I'm like, no, nah, I don't know about that. I read it in the Greek, right? So I know the best translation is the original one, and so I read it, and then I kind of put maybe the more accurate words there. So NLT didn't get anything wrong, but you're going to see a little bit of this. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Bless you. So these are fairly broad, and ultimately every Christian should be striving for these things, right? Sanctification, progressive sanctification. So as we come along, we should be getting better and better and better, not worse and worse and worse. Work on it. Now, there are very specific New Testament requirements for pastors, what we call pastors. And it's really a gift. Really, this is elder, overseer position. That's my office. The gifting is pastoring. Also, we'll see teaching is another gift. But in this culture, we call it pastor. So we're just going to call them pastoral requirements, but really elders. So here in America, it's kind of the same thing. So here's the thing, and I want to lay out a disclaimer for you. Fruits of the Spirit. You guys, y'all should be striving for that. Good. Just work on it, right? You're not going to get kicked out of the church, right? <laughs> not getting it exactly right. No, no, no. It's always, you know, pastors want to just keep encouraging, keep encouraging. But there's a different set of stuff that are for teachers. It's different. And most normal people in church won't really read it or pay a whole lot of attention to it. Because, eh, you know, how does this apply to me? I'll skip that part, right? Fine. So, they're really important, and I want to just, disclaimers, I want you to hear this, everybody, tune in, wake up, listen, all right, so if you're sleeping, get up. <laughs> so the next, all the next stuff I say, all that next stuff <laughs> that I say, it's for me, it's for me, and anyone who wants to, like, stand here for a long period of time. Guest speaker is one thing that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about someone who runs a church, all right, someone who teaches all the time, and any other church, this applies to them. So remember that. Okay, I'm not putting this on any of you. So you're going to see requirements in here. You're like, how do I do that? No, this is for people leading a church. But hear this too. Come on, right? So it's also like I'm trying to lead you into this stuff a little better, or maybe at least you'll get the fruit of the Spirit, right? So it's a little bit of both, but this, I'm not doing this to anyone today. Just every time I say these things, I'm doing this. I'm doing this, right? And if there are false teachers, yeah, they should quit. So basically, what can you strive for? In other words, if I'm not doing these things, how can you strive for anything? I have to be leading by example. So keep the question in your mind. Who should we listen to or not? The people that are fulfilling this. So 
Uh, two books mainly that you want to go to to find these, are, and you can put the scriptures up. First Timothy and Titus. So basically, it's like the kind of pastoral handbook, essentially. That's what these are. Titus is the short manual, and Timothy, the long field manual. Right, so, but especially 1 Timothy, what he's doing is he's writing to Timothy in Ephesus and Titus in Crete. Paul, sorry, is writing to them. Right? They're there to, now they're going to start building the church. So they want to appoint elders. That's their job, not vote them in. <laughs> appoint elders, and that's what they're supposed to do. So he's going to give them, like, this is what you look for in, in, in these elders. So 1 Timothy 3.1, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, literally it says overseer there, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife, one woman man in the Greek there. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, hospitable. Uh, when you look at the word in Greek, it's like the word philo is in there, like friend or brother. So you should be friendly. So you don't have, it doesn't say anything about the home in the Greek. But I get what they're trying to do. Hospitable. And he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker. It mentions wine in the Greek or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. And so that's very important. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. Where's my daughter? Give her that look. <laughs> and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Titus going to sound similar. So he's in Crete. Tell the elders there, an elder must live a blameless life. Sound familiar, right? He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have your reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live, live in a blameless, he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home, again, hospitable. He must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. I've added 1 Corinthians 9 there. It's very interesting. Paul is in the midst of the context, uh, eating meat, sacrifice to idols, kind of complicated, but I've explained this to you in the past. It is about food. Uh, he digresses a little bit about pastoral pay. There's a whole situation in there that's going on. No time for that. But he makes an interesting statement. Again, hear it this way, okay? 1 Corinthians 9.27, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Say, not too many pastors on a Sunday. So let's look at the chart. So you heard some similar things, right, from the fruit of the Spirit. It's very reflective, very repetitive. So I just want to give a shout out to my Greek teacher, Theodora. She helped me with this because as I can read much of it in Greek, there are some like weird, rare words that I, that I just don't know. A lot of rare words that I don't know. So I go to her and I say, hey, you know, can you help me with this chart? And she did. Now, the reason there's some repeat here is because what she was doing, I understand she's looking at all three and then she's kind of like, putting it all in there. I tried to take out some of the repetition, but I missed a bunch of stuff. So let's go through these. Irreproachable, beyond reproach. Anyone can accuse someone of something, but really what you're looking for is blameless, right? So go ahead, you know, someone accuses me of something, but if you look under my bed, there's nothing under there. No skeletons in the closet. I'm clean. I'm good. That's big. Can't, can't actually fall into the blame. Husband of one wife, one woman man is probably the best in my opinion, but Husband of one wife, because he's talking about a familial context. And in Greek, a lot of people don't know this. Husband and man, same word. Wife and woman, same word. So the translator has to decide what that is by looking at the context. And this is why she has husband and one wife, because the context is what? Manage his own family well. Agreed. Temperate, showing moderation and self-restraint. Self-control. Big. Respectable. Again, hospitable. So that's what I see there. Even in the church, I can be hospitable. Right? It doesn't have to be in my home. Skillful in teaching. This comes up again and again and again. And Paul will continue in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 4, he talks about in 5, you need to be a really good 
teacher. You need to be in the scriptures all the time. That is the primary function of an elder. The primary function is teaching. That's what you need not playing golf. <laughs> Your primary function is teaching. You need to be in the word constantly, all the time. Important. Again, gentle, without anger. Right? So uh, things make me angry. Yep. But you need to pray that away. That's not a good characteristic. I'm certainly not going to act out on it. Peaceable. All right? So peacemakers. So if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, right? they'll be children of God. We're supposed to be peacemakers. Blessed right? are the peacemakers. I'm always trying to find peace when I see conflict. Always trying to resolve that peace. We don't have to agree on everything, but we, we shouldn't be fighting about anything. Peaceable. Managing his own household. Again, those children, <laughs> right? Well liked by outsiders. Okay, so go to Nunzio's Pizza, ask them what they think of me. Loving what is good, <laughs> the pizzeria. Go to all the local pizzerias, right? And you'll find out if I'm well liked by outsiders. Loving what is good. <laughs> I thought you'd laugh harder at that. Prudent. <laughs> Just, not showing partiality like James 2. Devout. Here's I'm going to pause on this one right here. This is kind of something that we got to think about. Devout. Religious. And so, we go through a lot of this, right? <laughs> so, there are a lot of mainstream American churchy phrases that people say without really thinking about it or testing it with that. Because when you get to the book of James, if you keep reading past James 1.20 and you get to 26 and 27, you're going to see that he says, religion's a good thing. That's what he says. So, if I had to summarize it for you, I would say, because you hear the people say this, right? It's not about religion. It's about relationship. What are they really saying? I want to do whatever I want. <laughs> right? That's what I hear when I hear that, right? No, no, no. Right relationship leads to right religion. That's what the Word of God says. It's different. So I'm not saying just what Pastor Gene thinks or what, you know, mainstream Christianity just spouts off without reading the Bible. I'm saying exactly what the Bible says. Read James. Test my work. Read it. Tell me if I'm right. I'm right. Okay. So, <laughs> clear-minded and orderly. What does this person sound like? Right? It sounds like, like he's like the nicest army soldier ever, right, that doesn't fight. Like, <laughs> right? So, you know, but a very, like, disciplined, right, person. Someone's really got it together. They're orderly. They're clear-minded. Right? They're self-controlled. They're watching what... Well, it goes into their mouth, and what comes out of it? Both. They're watching it. So as a pastor, when you don't check off these boxes, that's it. Think of it like a degree. You know, you've got to do all the courses to get a degree. If you haven't done them, you're not getting it. But unfortunately, unfortunately in the church today, and we call them in martial arts, paper black belts, they're just, they're just handing them out. They are. Judge a tree by its fruit, right? So here's the thing. A pastor must not be addicted to wine, it says literally, right? So a drunkard. So from Jesus to Timothy, we see Jesus drinks wine. Timothy's told to drink wine for his ailments, alcohol, and it kills the bacteria. Nothing wrong with wine. Getting drunk, that's another thing. So if you're that guy, you know, you show up at a life group with a bottle of wine, you think it's for the group, and you drink it yourself, not a pastor, right? So, a violent person, that kind of thing happens. A lover of money, 1 Timothy 6. <laughs> the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what the Greek says. Did you, did you think all kinds of evil? Yeah, you can cross that out. It's not there in the Greek. Love of money is the root of all evil. Is it? Paul's really trying to drive home a point when he writes that. But it doesn't say all kinds. Again, mainstream, just because it's mainstream doesn't mean it's good. But someone probably told you that. All kinds of evil. Yeah. So Bibles are published by publishing companies who want to do what? Make money. Yeah, that's a real thing. Shouldn't be a new guy. Shouldn't be self-willed. Quick-tempered. Violent. Greedy. Right? So Pastor Gene does not need a private jet. <laughs> so somebody starts saying that. No, your wife needs to get another job. Right? <laughs> That's what we got to do. Shouldn't be greedy. Again, are contentious, argumentative. Shouldn't be a beginner, came up again. Novice, morally blinded, insubordinate, defiant of authority, disobedient to orders. Wrong. Shouldn't be. No. Again, very disciplined 
kind of without the violence, military type person. Is what you're looking at here. Again, self-controlled and disciplined. I cannot tell you how much that comes up from the Proverbs to Paul, <laughs> but certainly for church leaders. Self-controlled and disciplined. What comes out of your mouth and what goes in it. The Bible talks so much about that. And what's so funny, and I just, I have to say this, and you know who you are. I got a text back. If you want, I'll text you my daily devotional, Monday through Friday. I'll give you my number. I love texting it out. And so I send it out, right? And so it's whatever proverb that day is. So on the 23rd, on Friday when I sent it out, it was Proverbs 23. But 12, Proverbs 23 talks about gluttony and drinking too much. And so the person's like, ooh, you stepped on my toes. And I was like, yeah, I know. It's tough, right? <laughs> then I started preparing the message, and I'm like, Oh, no. This person's going to think like, man, he's going on a tear about this. Is he talking about me? No. <laughs> it's just what the Bible says. But here's the thing. Even if I went on a tear about it, I'd simply be talking about what repeats over and over and over again in the Bible. It's not like I'm one-offing this 1 Corinthians 9 verse and saying, you know, Paul would have been disqualified, you know, if he, he was eating too much. That's not a one-off. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Philippians is probably one of the worst ones. I'm just going to go through it with you, but just look at it. Philippians 3. Again, I'm happy to warn you about these false teachers. It comes up, even in Philippians, like one of the nicest of Paul's letters. It comes up. These people are dogs. These false teachers are dogs. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Can you think of anything worse? Their God is their belly. That's what it says. Gilea in Greek. Their God is their belly. You will know them. So it's a disqualifying feature. Like Pinocchio's nose, it exposes a false teacher. Again, me, all right? Remember that. So Proverbs 23, if, if you're thinking, wow, this really comes up, it comes up a lot. It just does. So we don't shy away from that. If you're new and you're like, oh, you know, this wasn't written to make you feel good about bad choices. It wasn't written for that. So here's the thing. Back to me, right? <laughs> One of the reasons for these is that me, I, and people like me in this job, in this calling, need to be examples in every single way. Every single way. All of those boxes must be checked off. Important. If the leaders aren't living it out, who will? The problem, the mainstream American church has turned those into suggestions. Think about that. Mainstream American church, they have turned those commands, not optional, commands from the word of God into suggestions. And now we have problems. That's why. It starts with the leadership. If, I, if I'm not checking off a few of those boxes, well, how can I, without being a hypocrite, tell you to get better, to get right? And so we all just start sliding. And so now everything's okay. We can do whatever we want. You know, when did it say, it says the opposite. It says we should never change it, never add to it, never take away from it. Okay. So there's a lot of greasy grace and very poor examples out there. Anyways, and just to share with you, look, wherever you're at, I've been there. Wherever you're at. I don't, you could be thinking, no way. Yes way. Yes way. I've been there. Wherever you're at, I've done it. I've done it. But when I came to Jesus with all, like, honesty and humility, he changed me. He changed me. I didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore. He changed me. So just trust me, it's possible. You have to surrender yourself in true and honest humility. And the rewards are amazing, guys. I wake up in the morning and I don't have to deal with that guilt, the shame, all that other stuff. You know, pick your difficult. So here's the thing, a protection for you guys. Tune your ear to God. <laughs> We're going to do something. So basically what happened is, put it on the screen, Gene. I'm like, oh, really? You want it on the screen? So this is going to be really funny. So we're going to do an exercise. I've done, I've done it before in the past, but I'll re-encourage you into it, and there's a lot of new people here. So here's what I want you to do. Tune your ear to God. Even if you're not a musician, think about your favorite song, right? 
And if someone butchers it, you know. You don't need a to be a musician to do that, right? You can hear a bad note. You'll know it's just there's something not right about that. The same thing happens with the Word of God. And if you read it carefully, a lot of people are hearing it. They're not always reading it. So look at Thessalonians, Colossians. So read this aloud to the church. They're probably hearing it more, more of the time than they're actually reading it. And we can get into the literacy rate and all those other things. But just <clears throat> they're hearing it a lot. And I listen to the Word of God a lot. Like, a lot, a lot, all the time. And it does the same thing like music does. When someone preaches out like a bad note, I'm like, nope, that doesn't sound like what I know. That doesn't sound like what I heard. And so there are books of the Bible that are really good for this training. And so I'm going to bring you into this. What we're going to do, if you're following me, is James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and 1 John. You're going to listen through those seven times, and you can take a week, a month, but before you listen to, and if you're tuning in from somewhere else, before you listen to anything but your local pastor's sermon, because that guy is praying for you if he's doing his job. And so he knows what you need to hear. Right? So the people I'm preaching to, unless you're new, I know most of you. Right? So I'm preaching to you. You know that I love you, and that's why I can do difficult messages. You know where it's coming from. It's like a dad. It's coming from there, regardless of your age. So don't stop listening to that. But all the people on YouTube, all the other stuff, go to these books of the Bible, listen to them, then go back and listen to some of these people. I said this to you guys last week. <laughs> no, someone else. Once I did that a few times, it made most modern preaching completely intolerable. Intolerable. It's nothing like this. Nothing. Try it. Because right? who do you want to listen to? God? Or just somebody's opinions if you can run you down the wrong path? God. Every single time. So here's a funny thing. So how, pray tell, do I listen to the Bible? I made a video. I used to work in the media department. I made a video for you. It's special, so bear with me. So check it out. This is my phone. This is actually my smartphone. I screen recorded it. Can we get it? Right, there we go. Music and everything. So you have to have some fun, right? So those are my Bible apps. C3 app. You're going to be told about that later. You get in there. You go down to media. Not obvious. Everything's pictures today. There was Bible, but you're going to have to scroll up if you want to get to it. Hit Bible. Then hit right there. Read the Bible. Down there, you're going to click Bible again. Not before you get rid of the ads. version wants you to go to them. I don't want you to go to them. I want you to stay in the C3 app. <laughs> hit Bible. Yes, he's really doing this. I was on Jeremiah. Why? Because we're going to do Jeremiah, right? So you can scroll down. You see the little sound things. you got to find one that has audio, like New Living Translation. That's where I read from. It reads easy. Right? So you can pick the book on Jeremiah. Right there, but we're going to go, for example, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Music goes nice. Then you're going to hit the little speaker, and this will come up. Now, this is New York speed. I'm going to bring it back to normal speed. One, one time. Chapter 3. Leaders in the church. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone now, to aspires to like be an elder, are dying. he desires an honorable <laughs> because I'm position. From New York. So, so elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. It's not he must be faithful to his wife. Head. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests. That is and he must genealogy be speed. He must not be the genealogy speed. That's he must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. Sounds he like must manage his own this family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Look, in this line of work, you've got to be able to entertain yourself. Right? So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Tune your ear to God. You don't have to listen on all the different speeds. I'm just trying to be funny. I had to break it up. I should have put that like in the middle, right, where I was getting really depressing. But anyway, tune your ear to God. Right? So listen to the following seven times. Right? James. All the way through, five chapters there. First and second Peter and first John. Now you ask yourself if that sounds anything like modern preaching. And here's the thing about those letters. They're like open letters to the church. They're not like First Corinthians where they're like these very specific people and specific things going on that are particularly wrong. You know, it's not that we don't listen to it. This is just for everybody. So you can just replace all the different places with now. Like it's what the church should be doing now as well. It never changed. The Word of God does not change. I'm going to pray for you from the scriptures from 2 Timothy with some encouragement as I close. 2 Timothy 3. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. 
All of Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work, and that is my prayer for everyone in the sound of my voice. Lord, humble us, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can go out and do good works. We can be vehicles for your love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.